It's early on Monday morning in Yangon, the capital city of Myanmar. People are watching a newsreader on the television. He's not looking directly into the camera, instead he's looking down, down at the sheet of paper from which he is reading. The state of emergency is in effect nationwide, and the duration of the state of emergency is set to one year. What's going on? People turned to their phones for information as to what was happening, but phone and mobile internet services were down. On the streets, military trucks were on the move, banks had been closed, broadcasters were unable to broadcast. But the military television channel was still operating, and what citizens were hearing was the military informing them that they'd taken control of the country. Their excuse was apparent election fraud during the recent general election. What the citizens of Myanmar were hearing was a military coup. Senior figures in the ruling NLD party had been detained, including Aung San Suu Kyi, who said, I urge people not to accept this, to respond and wholeheartedly to protest against the coup by the military. The coup was widely condemned around the world, but Myanmar's giant neighbours, India and China, reacted with noticeable silence. Two nations that are playing their own geostrategic game of which Myanmar is a part. Since the events of the 1st of February, citizen protests and brutal military repression has followed, causing thousands to flee, many into the so-called Seven Sisters of India, otherwise known as the North East, a region that shares a border with Myanmar that's 1,600 kilometers long, this border region also plays a significant role in smuggling routes. Gold, drugs, firearms, people, timber and so on. It all moves through here. This is Deep Dive, exploring organised crime from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. India and China together comprise a third of the world's population. The two giant neighbours have well over one billion citizens each. Two nuclear armed superpowers with a recent history that is both complicated and chequered. And they're not only in the same neighbourhood, they are direct neighbours. To understand the relationship between these two behemoths, you have to head back to when India was part of the British Empire. The northern tip of the northeastern region, so the part facing Tibet. This is Prem Mahadevan, a senior fellow at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime and author of the paper Crossing the Line, Geopolitics and Criminality on the India-Myanmar Border. There's a province there which India administers, but which China claims in, in large part. And this is because that province actually became part of British India under an agreement between the British and the Tibetans. But the Chinese government refuses to recognize that Tibet had any right to reach foreign agreements. So it claims that region as part of Tibet and by extension as part of China. So there is a border dispute in a part of the Northeast between India and China. India gained independence from Britain in 1947. Two years on from that, in 1949, the Chinese Civil War had come to an end with a victory for the Communist Party under the leadership of Mao Zedong. Now, what's interesting about this is that the two nations started on fairly good terms. India was the first non-communist nation to recognise the People's Republic of China in 1950. But just 12 years later, the two nations were at war. In October 1962, the Chinese People's Liberation Army, or PLA, invaded through Aksai Chin and into Ladakh, and also into Arunachal Pradesh in the northeast of India. The war lasted a month and was a resounding victory for the PLA, although they did withdraw back beyond the line of actual control, or LAC. In recent years, we have heard about border clashes along the LAC. In June 2020, in that same region of Ladakh in Indian-administered Kashmir, 20 Indian soldiers were killed in a skirmish, and the Chinese government have since admitted that four of its soldiers also died in the fight. This was the first deadly clash in the border area 
in 45 years. So why am I telling you all this, and what's this got to do with organised crime? Well, the geopolitical and strategic aims of both of these major powers directly affects the illicit economy of the Indian Northeast and Myanmar. As we move through this and track the geostrategic manoeuvres that are taking place, we'll tell the story through two locations that are just five and a half kilometres from one another. We have Moray in Manipur in India, right on the border, and also Tamu in Myanmar. These two towns are fundamental to understanding the illicit flows from one country to the other. So let's start with Moray in Manipur, a town shaped by its demography, and in particular, the Tamils. So the Tamils come from the Indian province of Tamil Nadu, which is actually India's southernmost province. It is quite sizable in terms of its geographic area and population. And since Tamil Nadu is a coastal province, they tended to spread out across Southeast Asia, and a large number of them ended up in Myanmar during the colonial era. The Burmese Tamils were expelled by the military junta in the 1960s, and they came back to India. Some of them tried to return to Myanmar because essentially having grown up in Myanmar, they found India a foreign country. So they tried to go back over land, and that's how a number of them ended up in Moray. They were actually trying to cross the India-Myanmar border, but Myanmar authorities wouldn't let them in, so they settled in Moray. And that's why Moray, you know, a remote corner of India, has a fairly large Tamil population. And these Burmese-origin Tamils, of course, by now they're 100% Indian citizens, but they retain their connections and their affections, their contacts with Myanmar. And this has meant that they're in a position to benefit from trading linkages which exist with Tamil Nadu province itself, as well as the Tamil diaspora across Southeast Asia. With Tamil communities also in Myanmar, the knowledge of the culture and language helped Tamils create businesses that specialise in cross-border trade. And one such industry that the Tamils dominate in Moray is the furniture industry, which relies on imports of the famous Myanmar teak wood, a wood prized but also at great risk. So perhaps here is a good time to focus on our first illicit market, and that's timber trafficking. The regions that straddle the India-Myanmar border are rich in forests, from the Mizoram Manipur Kachin rainforest to the northeast India-Myanmar pine forests. But Myanmar also has some of the most valuable teak trees on earth, and due to the composition of the wood, it has been prized for boat building for a very long time. But this demand is also driving illegal logging and the smuggling of timber. For a long time, the military in Myanmar has been interwoven into the illicit markets, and the illegal timber trade is integral to that. The Environmental Investigation Agency have been monitoring the Myanmar illegal timber trade for quite some time, and have recently warned that since the coup earlier this year, the military have taken over the Myanmar Timber Enterprise, MTE, the state-run entity that controls the timber sales that flow in and out of the country and the military have been reported to have seized timber from around the country in hopes of auctioning off nearly 200,000 tonnes of illegal timber to build up hard cash to continue the fight against their own citizens. But after the coup, the situation on the ground is really complicated. Have a listen to Faith Doherty, the EIA Forest Campaign's leader at the Environmental Investigation Agency, talking to the EIA podcast, What on Earth? All of the timber that is, all of the, all the raw material that is going um, out of the country at the moment is going over the land borders into India, China. We're not sure about Thailand, but we do expect that to start happening as well um, because the ports are essentially have ground to a halt, um, mainly due to the fact that people refuse to go to work. They have also joined the movement. So shipping is really curtailed. Um, and there has been a call 
not to use the ports that are controlled by the military. Um, so anything that's leaving the country, regardless of what laws may have been in place before, given that this is an illegitimate junta, anything leaving the country is deemed illegal. But in this instance, we go further than that and we say that it is aiding and abetting and legitimizing a military junta. You can listen to the full episode of What on Earth on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts. There's so much more to this illicit trade in Myanmar, we haven't got time to do it all now. So I'll put a link to the EIA's investigations in the summary to the show. Now alongside timber, unfortunately India, perhaps due to its size and biodiversity, has a real problem with the illegal wildlife trade. Indeed, a study from the NGO Traffic in June 2020 reported that wildlife poaching in India had more than doubled during the COVID-19 lockdown. After drug trafficking and precursor chemicals, which we'll come on to later, the biggest flow of illegal goods out of India and into Myanmar is wildlife products. Orchids and other wild plants, geckos, and in particular, pangolin scales, much of it heading to China and Southeast Asia. Here's Prem Mahadevan again. When it comes to the illicit wildlife trade, it often is the case that you've got, say, a, a poaching kingpin at one end, and then he sells to a bunch of middlemen who arrange for the transportation. So in Manipur, because there are these insurgent groups, a lot of them basically moonlight as poachers. They will kill a rhinoceros in Assam province or wherever they can get an opportunity and they'll smuggle the horn across. With pangolins, pangolins are killed in other parts of India and the scales are sent through Manipur overland. Southeast Asia, well, actually Myanmar, en route to China. So that's really how it operates. The actual poachers are often these village communities that want to make money. They're desperately poor and they really don't care about the environment and the harm that they're causing. Pangolins are well known to be the most trafficked animal on the planet. 36% of all pangolin seizures by Indian law enforcement happen in Manipur in northeast India followed by Tamil Nadu in the south of the country. And despite the vast distances between those two spots, they are linked by the economically influential Tamil communities in Manipur, centred around Moray. In 1994, Myanmar and India signed a trade agreement that allowed for the opening of land customs stations at both Moray and Tamu. At these two locations, two forms of trade were now permitted. Barter, when you exchange goods for another set of goods, and also normal trade, where goods are exchanged for cash. Only residents living within 40 kilometers were allowed to engage in the barter trade. These two locations were supposed to kick off bilateral trade, but it didn't quite work like that. It was hoped that as India and Myanmar trade increased, that Moray could become a hub. And this did not really happen because the Myanmar military set up another border market just 300 meters across from the zero line, just across from Moray. So I'll just jump in here and say what Prem's talking about here is a place called Namphalong Market. And if you go online, you can see just how close this market is to the border. And the result was that this border market actually became the real trading hub. It had a lot of cheap Chinese goods, which were smuggled in from China across Myanmar. And Indian customers just basically crossed over during daylight hours because they are permitted to do that. They would go and buy stuff and bring it into Moray. And from that, it would be taken elsewhere across India. So what we've seen is that this Moray Tamu Dyad, which was supposed to lead to the promotion of bilateral trade, actually became more a conduit for continued informal trade. It really never took off in the manner that it was expected to. These goods are smuggled across the border and further inland to Imphal, where they're sold at much higher prices. The Moray market section of Imphal's Payona Bazaar is apparently a hotspot for smuggled Chinese goods from Myanmar. Now what's important is that these goods are taxable, but it appears that they're largely overlooked by customs officials who are likely to be on the lookout for things like firearms or drugs. Now, 
Because the formal economy is so weak, the smuggling of consumer goods is a source of income for young men just trying to get by. The goods that appear at the Namphalong market are trucked in from Yunnan in China using considerably better infrastructure, whereas on the India side the infrastructure is poor. And to get them to Imphal they have to travel along the Imphal Moray Road, which is a favourite hunting ground for insurgents and criminal groups. Well, basically there are extortion rackets that are run along this road. It's more a matter of just paying off guys who demand payment in order to let a vehicle through. So Nam Falong was able to accumulate a lot of Chinese produce, which could then be brought across by human carriers to Moray and then sent elsewhere in India. Because of the extortion rackets that ran along the highway between Imphal and Mori, it was difficult to argue that this particular road, which itself still needs to be developed. So because this road was underdeveloped and not adequately secured, it was difficult to develop Moray to the potential which it may have had for trading with Myanmar. So why does the state allow this to continue? Well, according to our next speaker, the issues run deep in the Indian political system. You see, by and large, what you find is that law in India constrains those who abide by the law. They don't constrain those who choose not to abide by the law. In fact, the greater your violations, the more you pass outside the scope of containment or control by the authorities. This is Dr. Ajay Sani, the executive director of the Institute for Conflict Management the organization that runs the South Asia Terrorism Portal, which is an online database on terrorism, insurgencies and major violence in South Asia. There is a collusive sort of a dynamic between the uh, perpetrators of all patterns of crime. This is perhaps a slight deviation, but I would like to reiterate over here the fact that at least 35% of the uh, Indian parliament has cases of significant crime registered against them. The same pattern persists between 30 and 52 percent of all state legislatures are individuals who have cases of crime registered against them. So there is a often spoken of criminal bureaucratic political nexus, which has allowed organized crime to flourish, not just in the Northeast, but in theaters across the country. Most of these movements are winked at. People are not allowed to move. So I would not go to some of these areas without permission. But those who choose to go without permission, there's not much that is done against them beyond the extraction of certain bribes or periodic payments to regularize their residence or operation in these areas. The operational capacity of these criminal groups is helped by local corruption, but also policing capacity. The terrain is rough, so controlling smuggling along the border is challenging, to say the least. First of all, you know, state police play a very, very minor role voluntarily, not because it's part of the law, but because these states have tended to abdicate responsibility as far as these things are concerned. So the overwhelming burden of controlling the borders is on the central forces deployed there. Central force deployment in terms of the length of the border is very small. So you really have these widely spread out posts, often at distances of even, in some cases, 20 kilometers and averages of uh, barely a man a kilometer in terms of the available force, trying to oversee a border, which is enormously porous, especially in the Myanmar case and also in other cases, but other borders have been substantially fenced off. Modern fencing has been placed there. But in the Myanmar case particularly, but also in some other cases uh, with Bangladesh in certain areas, etc., what we find is that there are conditions that prevail all along the border. For instance, you've got a 16-kilometer depth on both sides of the border in which free movement is permitted. What Dr. Sani is talking about there is another agreement that was signed way back in the 1950s, which allows residents from either country to travel inside the other country's territory. It currently sits at up to 16 kilometers. So a person could travel across the border during daylight hours and stay in the neighboring country for up to 72 hours. But the border is really notional, and this freedom of movement helped build a large informal economy that far exceeds the official, formal cross-border trade. Crossings are not only made at the official points of crossing. Crossings can be made anywhere. Often villages are divided by the border. 
by the notional border, by this line that is supposed to pass through them. But there's no real physical division. People cross over both legally and illegally on a daily basis. So it's really, really difficult within such a loose arrangement to think that you can have border controls that in the Western mind of a physical border of points of transition, it's not like that. I mean, there are formal points of transition, but it is not the case that people only move across those points. And even at those points, you have a tremendous amount of corruption. A lot of contraband is moved across even these formal transit points or crossing points. So there is a factor both of the difficulty of terrain, the social demographic distribution all along a undefined border. It's, it's on the map, but it's not a real border. No physical borders exist in vast areas. And of course, the factor of collusion and corruption. Myanmar is currently in turmoil. This most recent violent repression by the military is just another example of the brutality against his own citizens that has spanned decades. My name is Thin Le Win. I am a Burmese journalist um, living and working in Europe. I was born and raised in Burma or Myanmar in Yangon, the largest city in the country and former capital. It's worth remembering that, you know, Myanmar for a very long time, for almost half a century, was a country under a military dictatorship where people just pretty much live in constant fear because saying the wrong word and, or being in the wrong place at the wrong time can get you into trouble. There was a massive brain drain over the past couple of decades as a result of that as well, because the country's education system was devastated. And I am part of one of the generations where we had to leave the country if we wanted to have a decent education. Ten years ago, in 2011, Myanmar began to open up quite suddenly. But despite civilian involvement in governing the country, the military still held the important levers of power. But it gave citizens a kind of freedom that they'd never experienced in their lifetime. And since the February coup, it was all taken away. People who were protesting against the coup, who wanted, you know, the civilian government restored and the election results to be recognised, they have become increasingly frustrated at the lack of support from the international community. And they now feel the only way that they can sort of get the military hunter to step away from holding on to power, you know, become yet another dictatorship that lasts 20, 30 years, is to fight back with arms. So there's you're now seeing armed resistance in urban areas, targeted assassinations with anyone linked to the military or considered as informants. So it's become incredibly unstable. And this is very different from full-scale civil war that you would see in places like Syria, for example. But there's definitely urban guerrilla warfare. There's a lot of bomb explosions. And like I said, targeted assassinations. It's very, very, very unstable. And yeah, it's, it's becoming more violent. The catalogue of violence has stacked up over the months. And it's been reported by Assistance Association for Political Prisoners that as of the 10th of September 2021, 1,062 people have been killed by the military since the coup in February. But despite all the firepower and the brutality, the military still doesn't have full control of the whole country. Partly because people have just been resisting in every way imaginable. You no longer see the kind of mass protest that you, you saw in February and perhaps up till March. But people are still resisting. There are 
flash protests, but, you know, the civil disobedience movement where people just refuse to turn up for work, particularly people in the public sector, that is still continuing. The coup and subsequent violence and unrest has created an environment where illicit markets can thrive. My name is Nicholas Farrelly. I'm the Professor and Head of Social Sciences at the University of Tasmania in Australia. There are probably three key points to make. The first, and this is based on my own research and discussions with people around the Sino-Myanmar border region, as distinct from the India-Myanmar border region, suggest that in a time of crisis like this, businesses that are dealing in illicit markets tend to benefit. Now, that's because of the, the lack of oversight, but also because people still need to get things done. And right now, at least, there's a fair degree of desperation across Myanmar society. Second is that the decision-making calculus for many types of activities has changed quite abruptly. The rule book was thrown out with the February 2021 coup, and now everybody in Myanmar and in adjacent areas is struggling to catch up, to work out what the rules of the game are and how they can maximise their chances of success. This means, of course, that doing business in the conventional style may no longer be possible and that unleashes all sorts of other forces. Uh, The third point, naturally enough, is that economic hardship in Myanmar is spiking right now. There are many communities that were already doing it tough, um, particularly because of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, and now they're having to deal with the coup. So I I think to summarise, what we can imagine is that uh, volumes are moving around There's all sorts of new opportunity for transnational actors, including criminal actors, to exploit these circumstances. And we're seeing movement across the India-Myanmar border in all sorts of different ways. It's worth highlighting that even some Myanmar police officers have reportedly defected, moving themselves into sanctuaries on the Indian side of the border so that they can seek to avoid repercussions for their disloyalty to Myanmar's new military regime. So it's clear that the the Myanmar-India border is lively right now, and we're likely to continue to see all of these dynamics playing out in challenging and unpredictable ways over the months to come. The violence we're currently seeing in Myanmar creates a demand for firearms and an opportunity for the illicit arms trade to flourish. In June, Voice of America News reported that Thai Customs seized 27 guns and 50,000 rounds of ammunition on the Thai-Myanmar border. And as we've heard throughout this podcast, both Myanmar and the Indian Northeast are no strangers to armed violence. Here's Nicholas Farrelly again. There's no doubt that weapons have flowed over many decades from a variety of sources in Southeast Asia all the way across Myanmar and then into Northeast India the region's insurgencies. And I I think here we need to consider the region in a broader sense. Northeast India and Southeast Asia have interacted for millennia. There are languages that are spoken in Thailand uh, that have very near cousins that are spoken in Northeast India. Those kinds of connections have allowed for a certain confidence. And during the 20th and now into the 21st centuries, we have seen a significant and relatively consistent flow of all manner of smuggled goods, including weapons, um, that have helped to sustain a variety of conflicts all across this terrain. The fact that almost everywhere you look, from northeast India flowing all the way down right across Southeast Asia, you see similar patterns of dissatisfaction with central government authorities have meant that insurgents, in some cases at least, perceive the bands of brothers on the other side of the border to have some common cause with their own struggles. And so with 
certain wars emerging, flaring up, becoming intensely difficult to control for central government authorities, it makes sense that supplies of weapons will flow in, particularly where there's an economic basis for their procurement or their production. And because the region itself has proved so amenable to other illicit trades, and we look, of course, to narcotics most acutely right now, the methamphetamine business, uh, but in previous decades, opium and heroin as well, through to timber of many different types, and then all of the other illicit trades that can prosper in relatively ungoverned spaces where an enmeshment of transnational criminal and insurgent actors come together to, yes, do business and then also seek to get other activities done um, to include, of course, in the vein of armed conflict. We anticipate that the kind of uncertainty that rolls across Myanmar right now is also going to aggravate some of those long-standing patterns where people who have built up links to supply weapons to cross-border groups will now perhaps have access to different types of weapon systems that can then be, be traded. Those weapon systems might come from official or even semi-official sources, but because across the region there are such well-established networks for handling this trade, it's not a surprise that we continue to see the flows of arms into the hands of those who are seeking to use them. The insurgent actors that Nicholas talks about have a long history in the Indian Northeast. Since Indian independence, there's been and still are several insurgencies in the region, from the Mizo National Front in 1966 to the United National Liberation Front of Manipur, which is a socialist separatist movement who've been operating in Manipur now for over 50 years. And then more recently, the Garo National Liberation Army, the GNLA, who've been involved in killing, abduction, extortion and other criminal acts. And from the very beginning, India has accused China of directly supporting insurgent groups. Here's Dr. Sani again. Through various phases, from the very beginning of the insurgencies in the Northeast, China has played a role in supporting insurgent groupings. This is right from the 1950s when our first insurgencies in the region started. Thereafter, we saw a kind of in a hiatus in the late 1990s, early 2000s, where China did not actually appear to be supporting any of the insurgent formations in the region. In the early 2000s, once again, we saw a sudden surge in the supply of Chinese weapons. The sheer volume of seizures in the region seemed to suggest that uh, given the kind of system we have in China, it was unlikely that such large numbers of weapons could simply leak out of the system without state support and collusion. Thereafter, what we've also found is that a number of insurgent leaders have been crossing over into China and meeting with Chinese leaders. They have spoken of this. This is not merely a question of relying on interrogation reports, but also on the so-called official communications of the insurgent groupings. So there is a very, very significant uh, body of evidence that suggests that China has been supporting insurgencies in the Northeast, continues to do so. And this, of course, also overlaps with India's broader insecurities with regard to Chinese intentions in this region, because they claim a very large part of the Indian Northeast as Chinese territory. So if these insurgent groups are being supported by the Chinese through the smuggling of arms, how much of a threat do these groups pose to India? Well, according to Dr. Sani, perhaps not as much as they once did. You see, first of all, we need to understand that the insurgency today is a, a tiny fraction of what it was even a decade ago or two decades ago. Across the region, last year, according to our database, there were only 25 fatalities. So while we keep on talking about the Northeast afflicted by insurgency and consequently what impact does it have, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Insurgency is no longer a significant factor in the Northeast, number one. Number two, if anything, 
it is drugs and other criminal activities that are keeping insurgent groups alive it is extortion it is crime it is the drug trade which is creating revenues which can are to be captured by the use of criminal force and a political pretension if the various insurgencies have apparently lost their political impetus and need the money gained from those involved in illicit markets to function, what does that make them? Here's Prem Mahadevan again. So many of the insurgent groups are effectively organized criminal actors. They just give themselves a fancy name and a reasonably impressive acronym comes out of that. But the groups themselves are basically extortionist they levy informal taxes they engage in poaching i mean once you've got weapons you basically can use them to poach wild animals so i would argue that the distinction between insurgents and organized crime is is really not very watertight here it's eminently permeable and this is partly because a lot of the insurgent groups in the region know that they simply don't stand any chance of achieving political goals through military means so they require funds to sustain themselves and thereby maintain a presence and remain viable. And those funds are raised through various kinds of violent activities or at least the threat of violence. I would argue that we are talking about a kind of a merger in many cases between insurgents and organized crime. Northeast India is not alone in suffering from insurgent groups. Myanmar has its fair share. But we'll focus on an organization called the Arakan Army, who are a Rakhine national group and are active in the Rakhine and Chin states. Chin state borders the Indian Northeast. Now, the rapid rise of the Arakan Army since 2009, according to an investigation by Global Witness, has been significantly financed by the jade trade through taxation of miners to brokering illicit jade sales. But alongside this, the Arakan army have been accused of involvement in the drugs trade, in particular a synthetic drug known as a yabba or crazy pills. It's a red pill that comprises a mixture of caffeine and methamphetamine. They originated in Thailand and although Myanmar is the largest producer of yabba pills, Thailand is a significant distribution center for them. These pills, they're, they're heavily in demand in Bangladesh and also to some extent in India. But Bangladesh is really reported to have a serious problem. We could call them a party drug in the sense that relatively well-off teenagers and young adults use them to get a high. They're considered a very potent uh, drug. Despite accusations from the Myanmar police, the Arakan army have denied involvement in the narcotics trade. Myanmar alongside Thailand and Laos make up the so-called Golden Triangle countries and Myanmar has traditionally played a leading role in the cultivation of opium poppies, the raw material for heroin. UNODC figures show Myanmar's opium production has fallen every year since 2014 and it's certainly a far cry from the levels seen in the mid-90s. With that being said, Myanmar still retains the position as the second largest producer of opium in the world. In India, there is quite a heavily regulated, legitimate opium industry. Opium is used for medicinal reasons, to create heavy painkillers like morphine or codeine. But then there is, along the remote border areas, unsurprisingly, an illicit side. Here's Prem Mahadevan again. In Manipur, opium is grown and it is then transported to Myanmar for processing into heroin. Locals often know about the existence of these opium plantations. And if locals know, it's very likely that local law enforcement knows as well. Efforts are made to shut down, to interdict opium supplies that are being transported and to also eradicate opium poppies. But the, the problem is, this is done, understandably, but it's done in a rather bureaucratic way. A government official might be told that for a certain number of days, he has to eradicate opium and he'll do that and then once that number of days has ended he will move on to another task it's not an ongoing priority mission it's not that india for example has a war on drugs type of mindset when it comes to opium it focuses on counter narcotics efforts quite aggressively but still these have to be managed within a larger 
structure or superstructure of policy priorities. And at the very top does lie the need for maintaining domestic security and a readiness, a military readiness posture vis-a-vis China. So that is really at the apex level of policy. Despite the decrease in opium production, Myanmar has seen a massive increase in the production of methamphetamine. And one of the main ingredients in that synthetic drug is a precursor chemical known as pseudoephedrine. Much of it made in India and then smuggled across the Indian northeast border into Myanmar. And the current security crisis in the country has exacerbated the issue. In August 2021, the Financial Times reported that a diplomat in the region said the lack of effective governance in the Shan state and increasingly other parts of Myanmar will continue to enable drug trafficking and all kinds of other illicit activities. As we heard earlier, this region is known as the Golden Triangle, so it's hardly surprising that powerful organised criminal networks operate in the area. Indeed, in January this year, we saw the arrest of a man called C. Chai Lop in the Netherlands, dubbed the Asian El Chapo in a Reuters investigation. He is alleged to be the leader of a transnational organised criminal network known to its members as The Company and to law enforcement as the Sam Gore Syndicate. The Reuters investigation highlighted the extent of methamphetamine production in Myanmar, mass producing drugs in so called super labs. In this case, the company was also getting pseudoephedrine from China. According to a Chinese counter narcotics official, such is the money being made that if they lose 10 tons and one goes through, they still make a big profit. They can afford failure. It doesn't matter. Now, since the military coup in Myanmar in February, despite the condemnation from around the world, somehow the military have managed to get a seat on the international stage. In April this year, at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs at the UNODC in Vienna, Lieutenant General Than Lane, the military junta's Deputy Minister of Home Affairs, a department that have been heavily involved in the violent crackdown against protesters, leading to a litany of human rights abuses and many, many deaths. He addressed the conference in which he proclaimed, Myanmar has made various efforts to eradicate drugs as a national duty. Special anti-drug operations are being carried out annually. So firstly, given the situation in Myanmar, was it right that Lane spoke at the conference? And is what he said about tackling drugs even true? Is Thin Lay Win again? For him to have that stage to be able to address his supposed peers from around the world and pretend as if he is a legitimate representative of Myanmar is, it, it would be laughable if it wasn't so atrocious and upsetting to a lot of people. And secondly, what he said. If I have to express what I really think about what he said, it probably wouldn't be broadcastable. Let's just say I think he was just lying. It's been well documented that the military, both in the past and I'm sure even currently, has been involved in so many of some of the drug issues and illicit economies. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that they say on the international stage just to placate everyone. And I think pretty much anyone who knows about Myanmar knows that what he is saying is not true. And whoever are the officials from the UN ODC should not trust what he's saying and it should not allow him more room to actually just sprout propaganda. And that's an important point. Surely the international community is under no illusions when it comes to the Myanmar military junta and their role in the illicit markets. Certainly the studies from Global Witness, like the recent one called Jade and Conflict, in which the jade industry is described as secretly controlled by networks of military elites, drug lords and crony companies with their roots in the darkest days of military junta rule. The military are shown to be intimately linked to illicit markets. Very much so. Very, very much so. And when I say this illicit economy, you know, we're talking about not just jade, but I guess timber, 
any type of border trade, whether it's just gun smuggling, human trafficking, animal trafficking. There's these casinos and along some of the borders, the military high ranking officials are very, very, very closely and intricately linked to all that all that economy. And, you know, and if you read that global witness report that just came out, and this is a follow up to another report, a fantastic report on Jade that they did, I think, about five years ago. It just shows how the Jade industry, which is, you know, one of the biggest money earners for the hunter, it has always, always been held by the military and its patronage network. If companies are not directly owned by military, it is owned by people related to the military, linked to the military, or people that provide support to the military. It's, it's, yeah, it's really hard to separate some of these illicit economies, particularly Jade, but also others with the military. Such is the alleged involvement in corruption and illicit markets that Global Witness claims that they have evidence that family members at the very highest echelons of the military financially benefit from illegal mining. Next we turn to that age-old epitome of wealth, gold. Gold, like many other smuggled goods, passes through the Indian Northeast, whether it be through Moray or Nagaland to the north of Manipur, where smugglers have taken advantage of one of the very few railway connections in the northeast at Dimapur town, creating a major hub for illicit goods. The northeast is again at the centre of a large gold smuggling network. Here's Prem Mahadevan again. Gold tends to be smuggled into India from two hubs, one's in the east, one's in the west. So in the west it's the Persian Gulf and in the east it's Thailand. And what we've seen is that as surveillance of air routes into India from the Gulf has increased. Gold is now being smuggled in larger quantities overland through Myanmar and into in the northeast into Manipur in particular. And, and this is happening largely because it's easier to control and check people who are coming in by air. But when you have a land border and you wish to encourage trade to whatever extent across that border, it's difficult to interdict people driving across, especially because there is no shortage of pathways and dirt tracks that crisscross the border. So for that reason, the Northeast is becoming a favoured corridor for gold smuggling from Southeast Asia. Manipur, again, is often cited prominently in reports on gold being smuggled over the border from Myanmar. Indeed, in June this year, an 18-hour search by Indian officials recovered 260 gold bars weighing 43 kilograms from a car in Imphal, which was said to be worth about 3 million US dollars. Like all illicit goods that flow back and forth in this region, these gold smugglers easily cross the border, taking advantage of the open border trade. Moray's position as an illicit market trading hub also stretches to the trade in humans themselves. Remember that freedom of movement agreement between India and Myanmar signed in the 50s? That allows those in the border community to travel freely for up to 72 hours and 16 kilometers into either country. Well, that's been exploited by organized criminal syndicates trafficking or smuggling people. Because India has exit controls at immigration, People who are suspected of being trafficked or engaging in human smuggling can be stopped and questioned. So for that reason, if you have a false Indian ID card or even a genuine one and you're just going across, and with Moray, you're allowed to go across without a visa into Myanmar, up to Tamu. So that means that people can cross over. You're supposed to return back the same day. But someone can just go across and then disappear. And it's not really possible then, unless you cooperate with the Myanmar authorities, to chase after these people. So for that reason, it's a kind of a parallel route, which is quite loosely surveilled. And it allows human traffickers to operate with some degree of impunity. This appears to be a more recent trend. In the past, women and young girls from Manipur were trafficked to other parts of India or Southeast Asia to work as sex slaves. But according to research, Moray has recently become a transit point for the most despicable crime, particularly for victims from Nepal, 
What's important to note is that the Nepalese government has banned certain categories of female travellers from flying directly to Gulf countries, purely to prevent them from being trafficked. In the past, trafficking victims were sent through major airports such as Delhi, where they were transported to wherever the trafficking destination was. Now though, because restrictions are tighter and the routes are more closely watched by the government, the traffickers head east before heading west. The victims are instead flown from Nepal into India and from there they travel by train and bus across northeast India before arriving at the border in Moray. Here the traffickers handle the paperwork, the victims are bundled into Myanmar where they're then trafficked west to countries like Oman, Kuwait and Iraq. As we heard, China and India are Myanmar's two biggest trading partners. Both countries have a vested interest in what happens in their neighbouring country. In the past, both India and China have taken very different approaches towards the internal issues within Myanmar. In 1988, there was a large-scale pro-democracy protest in the country, and India sided with the protesters, which led the military junta to freeze India out. And after that experience, this time around, the Indian government appears to have followed the Chinese approach. Here's Thin Lei Win. China is always very pragmatic, right? China looks to see what will work in its best interest. China did not want the coup, may have been expecting it, but didn't really condone it. But it seems like it has decided that this coup is going to stay, at least for the short to medium term, and they seem to be bringing the hunter back into their fold. India is interesting because, you know, Myanmar is in a way very strategically located, right? And India wants to have good relations, particularly because there are common interests along the border with India's dealing with, with its own rebel groups. And this time around, India has been much more quieter than 20, 30 years ago. They have not denounced the coup. They haven't said about all the people being killed. And it seems from what I can surmise, both countries seem much more intent on just going ahead with the hunter's plan, just because either because of common interests or just because they think it's better for, for border stability. And this raises an interesting point. India sees Myanmar as the overland gateway to Southeast Asia. Indeed, Prime Minister Modi rebranded the policy Act East, signalling an intention for India to take a more proactive approach to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. But the infrastructure between the two countries is very poor. So has there been any real change in approach? Here's Dr. Sani again. Much of what Narendra Modi is doing now has, number one, been facilitated by the fact that insurgency is no longer the magnitude of threat that it was in the past, and by the fact that now you can focus on developmental goals and issues. It is not as if the previous governments neglected or ignored the Northeast. It was just that they were able to do less at that time. And really speaking, I don't see that the Narendra Modi government in seven years has had a transformative impact on developmental issues in this region. The region remains backward, the region remains without significant industries other than certain extractive industries. So I don't see any dramatic or transformative influence or impact of the current government on the situation in the Northeast. Despite the significantly reduced threat from insurgent groups, they still pose risks to those transporting goods across the Northeast region. For example, as we heard earlier, the extortion rackets that run along the Infal More Road. Now, if the Northeast does go through a process of significant development through road building or an extension of the rail network, how will this improved infrastructure help those living and working in the Northeast? Here's Prem Mahadevan again. If you create transportation infrastructure, the people who really benefit are the people on the two ends of whatever trade corridor you created sending station and the receiving station, but not the people in the middle, not the various transit points through which a certain commodity flow passes. So local entrepreneurs in the Northeast, some of them are concerned that if more roads or railway lines are built connecting India with Southeast Asia, that the land that they live on 
would simply become real estate through which the high value goods would pass but they themselves will not benefit much from their territory being used as a transit corridor they are worried that an influx of money from outside the region could drive up living costs but not generate employment it's more about convincing local entrepreneurs that they actually have a stake in infrastructure development and that they will not be left out and this relationship and reliance on the informal economy is also important on the other side of the border in Myanmar here's Thin Lai Win so when Myanmar opened up i guess gradually in the last perhaps 20 years or so some of the informal economy around the whole country sort of get pushed more to the sides and i think it also in a way it's logical because when you're in the border area you've got multiple currencies Myanmar has very very long land borders that are very very porous to many groups I'm sure in Manipur in Yunnan some of these borders are just arbitrary in the sense that people have always lived in this areas for generations and you've got relatives on both side of this borders so people have always traded with each other have always worked together people have always crossed borders to find jobs to share things and that has always continued on absolutely informal economy is is really important for many border areas in Myanmar as well not just in the border areas with India but with China and Thailand as well so these communities in northeast india and myanmar rely on the cross border trade that flows in and out but then above all of this we have the presence of the titan to the north china and india's concerns over security of those disputed northern borders Here's Prem Mahadevan again. India's first and foremost policy concern is to ensure that China cannot have any aggressive designs on Indian territory. So that means ensuring that the military posture which can be maintained vis-a-vis China is sufficiently strong as to deter China from trying to essentially grab territory now we we must understand that the india china relationship although relatively stable is also unpredictable in the sense that china has a certain amount of diplomatic leverage over india by refusing to say acknowledge colonial era borders keeping the indian government the indian policy establishment off balance and so as a deterrent considering that india and china fought a border war in 1962 which india lost india's focus is to avoid a repeat of that and that means that the illicit economy in the northeast is very much a secondary or tertiary priority the first concern is really maintaining a military posture a military deterrent posture vis- vis-a-vis china which is focused really to the north The weakness of the formal economy does come down to a continued lack of development of the northeast. The topography of the region means the infrastructure work is challenging. Boring tunnels through hills, laying new roads and railway tracks. This kind of focused effort has so far been lacking and as a result, trade between Myanmar and India has not really developed to its fullest potential. Which leads people to stick to the more consistent informal economic activities. So we've looked at the myriad of issues facing the Indian Northeast and they are numerous drug trafficking timber smuggling human trafficking the illegal wildlife trade and so on we've looked at the relations between India and Myanmar and of course we've looked at the ongoing crisis in Myanmar as well and then finally we've told of the geostrategic concerns India has with China in the northeast of the country so finally what can be done to meet some of these challenges Well, let's go back to Prem Mahadevan again. I think the first priority for governments should be to to really convey to local communities. And when I say communities, I actually would start with officials that there has to be community level local buy-in in terms of boosting cross-border trade. And of course that has to be matched by efforts to create jobs. I would argue that it's necessary to to work out a plan for employment generation as well not just infrastructure creation 
and then sell that on to local communities. And it's a, it's a long-term process. I mean, we must remember that policymakers in a democracy, and let's not make it out or suggest that India is especially unique here. Policymakers in any country are first and foremost focused on the stability of their own electoral prospects, of their own political fortunes. And that does mean that whatever attention they give to developing a region that is more a multi-year, perhaps even multi-decadal process. I wouldn't say that this has been lacking in the case of India. I would say that it's much more that India has been too heavily focused on managing relations with its Western neighbor, that is Pakistan, and not adequately emphasizing the need to boost ties with Southeast Asia. In part, I think, because there is still that concern over China and its ambitions or designs on parts of the Indian Northeast. But I would argue that these concerns, while being maintained, that there needs to be a push towards building trade ties with Southeast Asia, because eventually that will help India develop as well as the Northeast, and it will be good for Southeast Asia. That's it for this episode of Deep Dive Exploring Organised Crime. I'd like to thank Dr Ajay Sani, Thinlay Wynn, Dr Nicholas Farrelly and of course Prem Mahadevan. Prem's paper, Crossing the Line, Geopolitics and Criminality at the India-Myanmar Border is available in the summary to this show where you'll also find a link to other research related to this podcast episode. If you want more analysis on transnational organized crime from around the world, you can head over to our website, which is www.globalinitiative.net. And finally, you've been listening to Deep Dive, exploring organized crime from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening.